Again, uh, how many find this year has been going by pretty fast? <laughs> Again, uh, October here is appreciation uh, month for the pastor. And this year we're going to do the uh, card thing again, but we uh, would want to have you on the, the uh, bottom of the card say what you most appreciate about Pastor and Sue. And uh, that way uh, they would get a more of a personal thing, I guess, about uh, uh, what they appreciate, what you appreciate most about the pastor and Sue. So, uh, again, I'll have a, a basket or something out here if you want to bring it. Uh, and we'll put it in a basket out here. You could have a, uh, if you want to volunteer and do windows, tell them you want to do windows for them. <laughs> if you want to do anything like that or take them out or, or um, but you know, I'm certainly glad that the pastor has been here for a long time, but yet he is uh, uh, a man of God. And I appreciate that about him so much. Uh, again, uh, next week we'll have a basket out there, and if you want to put um, a gift card or something, that's fine. Uh, but if you want to just write on the bottom of it what you most appreciate about them, why, that'd be great too. So, again, we thank everyone for coming today. So, Roland, it's up to you now. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think that what Dale said there, too, is for all of you who are watching this morning, uh, you can send that card, too, and uh, that will be gladly received. And uh, the rest of us who are here, we all know that uh, we have more of the congregation that would fill up these seats, but because of the COVID, because of all that's going on, Many can't be here, and uh, we appreciate that, and uh, we praise God. Yes. Children? You can go to Children's oh, Church. Oh, my, I yes. To that. I'm sorry, I should have said that. Children to the Children's Church. Um, I'm going to do things a little bit different than Pastor does, so whether you're here or whether you're in your, you're in your home, get a hold of your Bible this morning and turn with me to Romans Eight, and the verses that we will contemplate will be basically 30 through 39. And uh, we have an interesting title to this message. It's questions we ask in times of crisis. Uh, have we been there? Yes. Are we there? Yes. <laughs> um, considering what's going on around the world and and here in the United States as well. But in our personal lives, we have times of crisis, don't we? And um, today, I, I ask myself, and you ask yourself, this question, why is life so difficult? There are times in my life after passing from one trial to another that I want to cry out to God and say, enough, I can't take any more, that's enough. But God reminds me in his word from James 1-2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Now, reading verses like James 1 and verse 2 and others, we realize as followers of Christ that our difficulties are not obstacles. Rather, they are the path that God has permitted us to take so that we can learn from him and trust him to lead us. Five years ago, Joanne and I uh, returned from Mexico from the mission field after 46 years of being out there in, in uh, Guatemala. We went to Costa Rica first to try to learn Spanish and, and do as well as we could. And then we went to Guatemala after that, Mexico, 46 years. So uh, after that time, it was our turn to come home and take care of Joanne's mother, Irene James. And at that time, I found out through a yearly physical that I have chronic myeloid leukemia. Every day for the rest of my life since I learned that, I have to take a chemo pill. And, uh, you know, there are times I feel weak and tired a lot of the time that God uh, has allowed me 
to have this, but he's allowed me to have this modified body. Uh, I, that's what I call it anyway, modified body to serve him. Um, do you have things, do you have issues in your life? Perhaps you do. But we can praise him and we can serve him even with modified bodies. And for you who are listening and watching in your homes, you can serve him too, right? Where you're at, uh, we do miss you. There are seats here. There are pews that are open for you when you come back, um, those who belong to this church. And if you're listening in today, welcome to you as well. Um, maybe you have another church home, but we, we trust that the Lord will speak to your heart today also. Uh, so anyway, I have that modified body with many of you. Now, the Lord has not let me down in my time of crisis. Even through the limitations that I have, I'm able to praise him daily and thank him for my life. And you can do the same. In today's text, uh, I can say amen to Romans 8, 37. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, this morning, speak to our hearts. You know the the hearts that are hurting. You know the lives that are hurting. You know the crisis that we're going through. And you know how to help us in this time. And Father, you know exactly what we need. So I pray that through the questions that are asked here by uh, the Apostle Paul back in that time when this was written, that you'll speak to our hearts today too. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting with verse 30, uh, we will read the scripture and you can follow along in your Bibles. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also uh, justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly, uh, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other cre created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord." May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now let's go back and consider those questions. Uh, the, we have from those verses from 31 through 35, we have six questions that need to be answered. And you'll find out that in the sixth question, it's actually sixth and seventh. Uh, but that's grammatically speaking. So anyway, we'll, we'll start with the first question. What then shall we say to these things? Now, the things that Paul refers to are found in verse 30. And he pre it tells us there, he predestined us. That big word means he knew us before we were born. That's right. He knew us before we were born. He called us to be his children. He forgave our sins. And in Christ, we are justified. Ha. Huh. That means without sin, just as if I'd never sinned. That's the word for justified. 
Uh, never that he, after we ask him into our hearts and he forgives us of our sins, we are with, uh, without sin, sin standing before him. That doesn't mean we don't sin, but we confess our sins and he's faithful and just to forgive us those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the sin of unbelief has been dealt with when we trust in Christ as our Savior. One day, uh, we will be glorified. Ha, huh, that's the last one. Not yet, but Paul speaks of it as if glorification's already in the package, which it is. And one day, we will stand before him in glorified bodies. What are they like? I have no idea, but I know that I'm going to drop this robe of flesh and I'll stand before him in his presence, uh, in the robe of righteousness, if you will, uh, which will be maybe white. <laughs> That's what they claim. But anyway, all of these are, is a result of asking Jesus to be our Savior. Praise God. Num question number two. Uh, you'll find that right there in the text, verse 31. If God is for us, who is against us? We are on the winning side. In verse 32, Paul explains, first of all, how God the Father did not spare his son, but he paid the price. If you're with me in that verse, it tells that very thing. He said, he paid the price. Rather, he who was uh, who died, Christ Jesus is, a, is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Uh, he is there. He justifies us. He paid the price for our sin. And this, uh, he's given us eternal life as a result. And... Uh, the third question comes up, how will he not also with him give us all things? In verse 32, he will give us freely all things. And this is interesting. What things are they anyway? What things does he give us? Um, just to name a few, and if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty of it all, go to Galatians 5.22 and you'll find uh, all of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, uh, meekness. And, and then it ends it all by saying, against such there is no law. No law will keep us from uh, producing the fruit of the Spirit. And this is what puzzles the world today when they see you and they see me in our godly examples with a smile on our face. When peace in our hearts. And they say, how can you be so peaceful when all of this is going on? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> it is God in me, not me. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. And we de I depend on him. If it were me, you would see a much different person. <laughs> I would be all frustrated. I would be all uh, taken up with all of this. Does it affect us? Yes, it does. But we're reminded this morning by the Apostle Paul, along with the Romans in that time when it was written, we are reminded, hey, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And when we ask him to come into our hearts, he's given us the entire package. package. We have the fruit of the Spirit that we can produce. Not us, but Christ in us, producing it. So others will see Jesus and not us. Um, don't think anybody really wants to see the real Raleigh or the real Roland that I am. They don't want to see me. They want to see Jesus in me. So let's go on. We're going to the fourth question. And this is found in verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justified. Okay. God, um, who will bring a charge, that is to say, against God's children? Huh. Satan tries to tempt us. 
He intimidates us, doesn't he? He tries to uh, tell us different things. He uses our flesh or our conscience or other people to condemn us before God. Nevertheless, we've been forgiven. And this is our standing, our position before God. We're a forgiven people when we trust Christ as our Savior. It is God who justifies. Have you or I ever said, I'm not worthy? I'm not worthy to be saved. I sin so much. And you know, there is one, that, as we've already mentioned, who uh, is, uh, we're going to read, and if you'll save that place where you're at in Romans, and go to Revelation 12 and verse 10. I'd like to read that to you. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before God day and night. Who is the accuser of the brethren? It's Satan. It's Satan. And he's been thrown down at this point. His future doom has been established. But he was rendered uh, without power, without any kind of power at the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, when he was nailed there for our sin, and he rose up from the dead, he's given us the same eternal life to be with him forever. Now, as we see that, we realize we are more than conquerors. What does God say to him, to Satan, when he accuses us day and night? He says, out of here, Satan. You have no power. This is my child. I bought him with my precious blood. That's what Jesus replies to Satan. Do we have power over Satan in the flesh? No. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we do. We, can, we are more than conquerors. It wouldn't say it in the word of God if we aren't. Now we, we're back in Romans 8 again. And I would like to go as we uh, see the question number five. That comes up in verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Who is the one who condemns? Uh, well, we just saw Satan, right? But he's rendered powerless, powerless, and his claims are false because Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us, as the verse says. He's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. I'd like to take us to another passage, and that's found in John 17. Again, keep your place in Romans. We're going back there. But I'd like to take us to John 17. John 17. And in John 17... We're going to start in verse 15, and I'd like to read it through 21 to get the full context. I do not ask, this is Jesus praying for his disciples, and then as you'll see, for all of us down through the ages, before he went to the cross. This prayer is written, it's still effective. The intercessory prayer of Jesus with the Heavenly Father I do not ask you, Father, to take them out of this world, verse 15, John 17, but to keep them from the evil one, from Satan himself. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world, speaking to the disciples. Sanctify or set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, uh, Father, Jesus speaking, I also have sent them into the world. 
For their sakes, I have set myself apart or sanctified myself that they may themselves be sanctified in truth or set apart in truth. Now, here comes the kicker. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, of those disciples, but for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Wow. Isn't that wonderful to know that he's interceding for you? He's interceding for me right now. Wherever you're at, he's interceding for you if you know him as your personal savior. And then we go on after we see all of this that uh, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Aha, that applies to us as well. You say, why can't I go home to be with Jesus? Because your time hasn't come yet. It will come. It will come. And when it does, then you'll say, your work is done. I'll take you home to be with me. Uh, that's the way it works. And sixth, the sixth question comes in verse 35 of John of Romans, excuse me, Romans 8, 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Huh. In 1 John 4, 18 and 19, the Christian's response is to God's love. First of all, in verse 18, it says to us, perfect love casts out fear. Have you been fearful? I must confess I have been, this old flesh. But you know what? Perfect love casts out that fear. That's what the Word of God says. And then after that, it says, we love him because he first loved us. Let's get the perspective right. It's not about me. It's about him. He, he loved me first. <laughs> he loved you first, not the other way around. And so as we look to him and keep our eyes centered on him with his love for us, that perfect love is going to throw that fear right out of your life. It can't stay there because we don't hate, we love. We love. There's a lot of people that go around talking about hating today, don't they? But you know what? We love him, and then we love one another because he first loved us. <laughs> it, all, it all is contagious. Let's get a hold of that one. <laughs> they say the virus is contagious, yes, but this is contagious. This love, if we show others that love. Um, let's go on then. <laughs> I have a, Joanne and I have a little game that we play with the grandchildren in Chicago and uh, it's, a, it's a strange one, but we say, Te amo mas a ti. I loved you first. And when we say that, uh, if we catch them off balance, you know, then they have to give us a high five, whether it's on telephone or whether it's in our presence. But what a game to play. Te amo mas a ti. I love you more than you love me. <laughs> and that's, that's the way it comes out in English. But... Uh, we love to play that little game with them. So the answer now to the sixth question is a resounding, no one can separate us from the love of Christ. Uh, but from there, uh, we bounce off from that another question, the seventh question. Grammatically speaking, it's what, right? Who is one thing, but what is another? And the scripture shows us that there's a what there. Now we see the answer to the what in verse 35. Uh, let's, let's read that as we see it there. It says, will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? All those things. 
Let's go ahead and take those apart one by one. Tribulation or distress. Uh, situations out of our control. Like sickness. Whatever your sickness may be. Disease. Uh, that's another one. This COVID-19. And all the rest are included there. Will they separate us? No, they won't. And then persecution is the next word. If you're following along in your Bibles, and verse uh, 35, persecution. Those who harass others, or maybe you they've harassed, because of your faith, or even murder Christians, which is happening in many places around the world. That will not separate us from the love of Christ. Famine. It's interesting, we talk about famine, and I hear that there's a bountiful harvest this year. Did you know that one out of every nine people in the world go to bed hungry? One out of every nine people. They would just love to get one little handful of your corn and grind it and have it to fill their stomachs before they go to bed. Or soybeans. Think on that one. One out of every nine people go to bed hungry every night. Um, it happens. We saw it in Mexico. We saw it in Guatemala even. Some of those people, they have a little more than they may have in other places. But they don't have the money to get more. And they may have just a tortilla. Have you eaten a tortilla? Well, some of you say it's lacking. <laughs> it's like a, a flat piece of, I don't know what, but they would just have that and put a little of the hot chili pepper on it, and then that would quiet their stomach down. I don't know how, <laughs> but that's what they would eat, and that was all they had. If they had a little bit of money and they could have something, they may have beans, just beans, with that tortilla. So people are going to bed hungry. Next word there is nakedness. This goes along with famine, when there's not enough resources to dress properly. But can any of these separate us from the love of Christ? A resounding no, they can't. Peril or sword. Some of you will remember, those who are watching, perhaps not, but John and Missy Kamiola from Nigeria were here for our missions conference. He works with the Voice of the Martyrs and providing, and she works providing a house, a safe house for victims of sexual exploitation. Um, We happen to hear just a little bit more of what they are up against, how Christians in Nigeria are being killed by a radical Muslim group called Boko Haram in northern Nigeria. Their lives are on the line. And it's not only there. The peril or the sword is being used brutally in the Arab world where if you don't believe in their way of teaching, your head comes off. They kill you. And your, your, your wife or your husband or your family is watching as this happens. And what is it doing? It's bringing more people to Christ. And these people are ushered into the presence of God into his glory. That's why it's important to get the word of God out. I just prayed with the Gideons yesterday on Saturday. Their goal is to get the word of God out in every language in the world. And they're going into places where you and I can't go. The Bibles are getting there. People are paying the price who are Gideons in those places handing out the word of God. In many cases, they are 
taken by the sword. But I, why do I say this? Because it's a mission. It's one of the missions. And then there are many missionaries who were out there, like Sandro and Hope. They're in a very difficult area as well. And they've seen things happen. But, you know, returning to the question, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Even in death, we are more than conquerors. Romans 8.18, in Romans 8.18, if you look uh, back in the scripture there in Romans 8, still in Romans 8, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The Apostle Paul said that, but how many of us can say that? I've gone through so much suffering. You don't understand, Rollin, or Raleigh, what I'm going through. No, but I know he does. He understands what we're going through. And these sufferings are not worthy to be compared to that time. Hmm. Not worthy to be compared to the glory. What glory is he speaking of? Being in heaven. Being there with a glorified body. And praising our God for eternity. Well... The Apostle Paul experienced many of the hardship, many hardships in his lifetime. And to get a closer view of that, again, keep your place in Romans 8. We're going back there. But in 2 Corinthians, just to get a peek at what happened in his life, we're going to start off with verse 23. As Paul is talking to the Corinthian believers and he, say, and he says, uh, you know, there are Hebrews who have come to know Christ as their Savior. And he said, are they Hebrews? So am I. Paul says, I am too. Are they Israelites? So am I. I'm a Jew. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I, he says. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so in as far in far more laborers, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. And the reason he says 39 lashes is because they wanted to do it according to the law that God gave them. So they didn't want to go over 40, and they stopped at 39. But still, they did it with a cat of nine tails with steel in, the, in that whip that they lashed him with. Now let's go on. Three times, Paul says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep out in the ocean. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers. Dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The Lord and Father of the Lord Jesus he who is blessed forever knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, the ethnarch under Eretus, the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. 
Paul knew what it was to be persecuted. Paul was left for dead on one occasion when they stoned him and he went out and going out of the city. But he arose miraculously because God wasn't done with him yet. And he went on to preach. Um, we can all say, wow, we have not been tempted like Paul was. And even through, even though, even though life throws these many curves at us with many obstacles to trip over and temptations to sidetrack us from knowing that God loves us, he provides us with peace, joy, patience, perseverance, and strength through all the trials. You cannot name a trial that he is not there. What does a person do without Jesus Christ in their life? Right now, they are saying, I don't know what to do. I'm really, there's so much hate all around me. I don't even know how to respond to my family. I don't know how to respond to my parents. I don't know how to do this or that. There's so much hate. And you only have to work in the workaday world, in the schools, and in other places to find these kids are not getting love in their homes. They're getting a lot of hate. The first words that they start speaking when they're two years old are swear words coming out of the mouths of their moms and their dads. They need the Lord. The only ones that they can get any kind of love and patience from are the teachers who are Christians or the assistants who are there with the teachers. That's just a little example. You all can give me more examples in the workaday world. You know that there are a lot of people and maybe you're watching today and you say, I don't know Christ is my Savior. Or maybe you're sitting in these pews, in one of these pews. You can trust in Jesus Christ. You can come to him. You can say, I know. I've heard all about you. I know that you died for my sins, for the sin of unbelief. I trust in you as my personal Savior, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart. He'll come into your life. He'll come into your heart. He'll change you. You'll become a new creature in Christ. And little by little, those old things that you used to do will pass away. Pass away. And believe me, this new life in Christ, it never ends. Never ends. It's eternal life. And when we fail, I think that I've learned to say, forgive Forgive me. <laughs> I, I, I sinned. I said this and I shouldn't have said it. And I eat humble pie all the time. <laughs> but he gives me the grace to do it. <laughs> and I know that he is the answer to your life. Now we come on down here to Romans 8.36. And we see just as it is written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We work considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And in Isaiah 53, we find that one, Jesus Christ, mentioned 600 years before he was ever born on this earth, but he existed with the Father. He is eternal. And it tells right down to the letter, how as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He went to the cross he died for you. He died for me on that cross. That's what this is talking about. And Psalm 44, 22 is quoted there. Our wonderful Lord Jesus Christ led the way as a sheep to be slaughtered, predicting his uh, purpose like a lamb that is to be slaughtered. He willingly gave up his life for us on the cross. The just one died for the unjust, the unjust sinners that we are. Romans 8, 37, we go on as we go through Romans 8, and it says, but in all these things, 
we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And then we come to the last two verses. The conclusion to all that Paul has said before in Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, which would mean the demons and Satan, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have three things that I want us to take away from this today. Perhaps there are more. Perhaps you've even gleaned some more in there in those questions. First of all, we dare not say if trials come into our lives. They come into every human being's life. It's when trials come into our lives because every person is born who is born will experience trials in this life. So when they come, uh, we need to have that fact established. If they haven't come to you, they will. More trials will come. Number two, God loves us and has provided us with a Savior. And in those trials, nothing can separate us from God's love. So when the trials come, nothing will separate us from his love. And the third part is our part, to trust in him. As we trust in him, he's faithful to keep us. And we can trust his promises. Heaven awaits you and me. When we know Christ is our personal Savior. And we will be with him forever. There's no getting around that. I'd like to have us pray as we finish up this message. Father, there's so much that we can apply and all the questions answered, it comes back, roaring back to us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Help us to trust you, Lord, when those trials come. Help us to know that you love us. And nothing will separate us from our Savior. Nothing will separate us from our faith in you. Help us, Lord, to live that life and help us to show that example to those around us, to our children, to our grandchildren, to our parents, to each and every one around us, our neighbors, to that person who seemingly is unlovely, Help us to show Christ to them. We'll give you all the praise for everything you do, both here and in the homes that are watching today. In Jesus' name, amen.